Okay, so we are going to talk today, um, this is an overview of the digestive system. And so this is uh, where we're going to start. And basically just in very big picture broad terms, digestive system is responsible for ingesting food. We're going to process uh, that food in order to um, be able to absorb the nutrients that we can get from the food that we eat. And then basically we just have to get rid of any um, excess um, or non-digestible food stuff that we don't need. So that's it in the big picture. And we're going to talk about the organs involved and the processes that allow for that to happen in our body. So when we look at the digestive system, we can di um, divide the digestive system up into two different groups. And so one of them is what we refer to as the alimentary canal. And so we can basically think about this as like a tube. This is our GI tract. And this is a tube that goes from our mouth or our oral cavity all the way through our body. And it comes out um, at the end at the anus. So technically, um, um, food and, and other um, nutrients that we're digesting that are within this alimentary canal are considered to be external to the body because it's basically open at both ends and these, um, these things that are contained within it are not within our body at this point in time. So you can kind of think of it as a long um, tube or a long canal and I've listed out for you here, these are the structures that are included in the alimentary canal. So we basically got the mouth or the oral cavity, uh, pharynx, which we're used to because of the respiratory system. You've already um, been introduced to that. Esophagus, which is going to be a long muscular tube that's going to travel down to the stomach. We're then going to travel through small intestines, large intestines, and then the distal end of the large intestines ends with the anus and that leads to the outside of the body. So again, basically a long tube. Uh, we do have other organs that play a role in digestion and we call these our accessory digestive organs. Okay, so they are not part of the tube, but they are organs that are located outside of that tube that secrete their, um, their products into the tube to help with digestion or help in other ways. So um, included in our accessory digestive organs would be the teeth, um, the tongue, because they help to manipulate food in the oral cavity, um, salivary glands play a role, and then um, gallbladder, liver, and pancreas also play a role in digestion. So all of these are considered accessory digestive organs. So we're going to talk about all those. Okay. And so here we have it as a broad overview. Um, if you, if you think about the alimentary canal as our, um, long tube, like we've talked about here, we're going to ingest food through our oral cavity. It's going to travel through our esophagus. It's going to travel through stomach here. Um, it's ultimately going to travel all through our small intestines here, come up through large intestines, and then eventually end up at the anus and then outside the body. So it's basically just this long continuation. Um, and then you can see accessory organs um, on this picture are listed um, and are noted with an asterisk. So like the liver, the gallbladder, um, pancreas is going to be um, are all accessory digestive organs. Here's our salivary glands um, up in the oral cavity, our tongue, and then our teeth would be included in there as well. Okay. So what's included when we talk about digestion, um, we can basically break it down into these individual processes that occur as part of digestion. So in the beginning, we have ingestion, which is basically the process of actually eating the food. So we need to get it into our body. Um, we need to be able to um, move that food along our tract. And we're able to propel it, or we call that process propulsion. And um, a couple of these you're already familiar with. So when you swallow food, 
Um, that's a voluntary process that um, allows us to propel food from our oral cavity into our esophagus. Um, and then we also have involuntary peristalsis, which is going to be contractions of smooth muscle that helps to move food along our digestive tract. We have the mechanical breakdown of food. So examples of this would be chewing. So our teeth play a major role in this. Um, chewing food to break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, our salivary glands are going to release saliva. And when we chew and move our food around with our tongue, it's mixing the food with our saliva. Uh, we also get a churning of food in our stomach and that helps to break it down even more. And then the process of segmentation, which are kind of um, alternating um, areas of contraction of smooth muscle within the intestines. All of these are mechanically breaking down the food into smaller and smaller pieces so that we can digest them a little bit easier. And then we also have the process of digestion, which is where we have enzymes that are present to help break down our food into simpler building blocks that can move into our bloodstream and then travel and are used at different distant sites. We have the process of absorption, which means that our body is basically reclaiming nutrients and water. We're moving substances, we're moving water and nutrients from our GI tract into our bloodstream because we want to keep them. So that's the process of absorption. And then at the very end, um, kind of our last process of digestion here is going to be defecation. And so this is the elimination of substances that we are not able to digest and we are getting rid of them as feces. Okay, so this is basically showing you all of those processes that we just talked about and where they happen at different um, points along the pathway of the GI tract. So that's a good overview. Okay, uh, this is just um, clarifying for you the processes of peristalsis. So peristalsis, um, this would be an example of the esophagus traveling down. And so this is how we're able to move food down our esophagus. It's basically like a muscular tube. And it contracts in kind of progressive areas as you go along the tube. Um, but we also see this in other areas of the, of the GI tract. I just Esophagus is kind of easy to picture. So you have progressive contraction, which is basically going to move the food further and further down um, the digestive tract. On the other side of things, we have segmentation, which is basically like, um, like an alternating contraction re relaxation of different areas of the digestive tract. And what happens with this is that it further breaks down the food. So this would be like the process of mechanical um, breakdown of our food. And it's going to mix the food and um, allow access to um, enzymes to help to break it down. So this is another example of mechanical breakdown of food where we're dividing it up into smaller and smaller pieces. Okay, so where are these digestive organs located? Well, if you think way back when we talked about different cavities in the body, these um, organs are located in the abdominopelvic cavity. And we know that all of our ventral body cavities have serous membranes associated with them, and that these are double-layered serous membranes. And so we're going to have a visceral peritoneum and a parietal peritoneum. So this should sound familiar at this point. Um, visceral means organ. So if you look, this is a cross-section, so sagittal plane view of the um, abdominopelvic cavity and you can see where we've got some organs um, kind of outlined here and if you see here in blue that is going to be our visceral peritoneum okay so that's going to be the peritoneal layer of the serous membrane that is against the organ itself we also have um, 
a peritoneal membrane that's going to line the interior of the abdominal pelvic cavity. And so if you look at this on cross section, it's going to be this membrane here. It is going to be the parietal peritoneum. So it lines the interior of the cavity that those organs reside in. And we know, similar to all of the other serous membranes that we've talked about this semester, we do have fluid that's present in between those two layers. And so that's serous fluid, and it's there to reduce friction uh, and to allow those organs to move um, against one another. So well, you can also see too, like in this picture, do you see how these organs look like they're kind of like hanging down from the back of that abdominal pelvic cavity? And they kind of are. So we have like, it's called mesentery. So the, this is parts of peritoneum that are anchored to the back of the body wall, and then the organs are attached to it. And it helps to provide some stability to those organs. Um, and helps them stay kind of in the right place. But that's that's why you're seeing that on those pictures. Okay, so histology of the um, GI tract or the alimentary canal. So the digestive tract has four layers. So that makes it a little bit unusual because we usually talk about how all things in anatomy come in threes, right? So this is this is a little bit different. So it does have four layers or four tunics, and this is what we see. Um, generally throughout the whole digestive tract. So the first layer is going to be the mucosa, and this is the most internal layer. And so typically what we see here is it's comprised of simple columnar uh, epithelium, and it has some different functions. So one of its main function is mucus secretion. So we're going to see that in a variety of locations, um, like from the stomach, it helps to protect the wall of the stomach against the acidity um, of the stomach contents. And um, in the large intestines, we have mucus that helps the passing of feces go a little smoother. Um, mucosa is also responsible for absorption and um, protection um, from um, contents within the digestive tract. Okay. Now, the next layer out from that, so we're going deep to superficial, so the next layer, um, superficially, is going to be the submucosa. And this is comprised of areolar connective tissue. So if you remember, that's going to be a loose connective tissue. And loose connective tissue is basically there. It forms kind of like a loose scaffolding, and it helps to hold structures together. So this is where we're going to have blood vessels, we're going to have nerves, and um, lymphatic vessels traveling through there, and they're basically contained within that loose um, connective tissue um, scaffolding. The next layer is going to be the muscularis. Okay, so this is our layer of smooth muscle, and it's typically going to be arranged in a couple different directions. So we're going to have both circular muscles that are going to be you know, arranged circularly, and then we're going to have longitudinal muscle fibers that are going to go kind of along the long axis of the, of the organ. Um, another thing that's important that we're going to see throughout the digestive tract is the presence of sphincters. And sphincters are basically areas of thickened, smooth muscle that help to control movement of substances going from one area to the next. And then the outermost layer of the um, digestive tract is going to be the serosa. And this basically is another name for the visceral peritoneum. Okay, so serosa and visceral peritoneum are synonymous. It's going to be that outer um, layer, um, outer serous membrane on the surface of the organ itself. Okay. So here we have it in cross section. This is a this is an image from your textbook, and so here's our deepest layer. This is going to be our mucosa. So that's the most um, internal. Next layer out is our submucosa. Then we've got our smooth muscle layer, and then our outermost layer, otherwise known as our visceral uh, peritoneum. It's going to be on the outside. Okay, so what we're going to do is go through organ by organ and talk about what's happening there. So we're going to start with the stomach. 
And so stomach is our first um, organ that we get to um, when we're traveling through our alimentary canal. And we do know that stomach is innervated by our autonomic nervous system. It has both sympathetic and parasympathetic input. And if you think back about our rest and digest, so you know that um, parasympathetic um, activation of the stomach means the stomach is being activated. You are actively um, digesting food. Sympathetic innervation, if it's, um, if it's in demand at that point, then your stomach is actually going to shut off because it's not really that important uh, when you're running away from a bear to digest your food. So understanding um, how they each play a role. We know from our blood vessels that the stomach is supplied by the gastric arteries. Remember we had a left gastric artery and a right gastric artery. And splenic artery um, on its way over to the spleen also sends out off some um, arterial blood supply to the stomach as well. And we know that those arise from the celiac trunk. Uh, we have venous drainage from the stomach into the um, hepatic portal vein as it's being routed through the liver before it returns to the systemic uh, venous circulation. And what's interesting here too is that um, with the stomach, the muscularis layer has an additional muscle layer. So typically we already see two muscle layers in the stomach. We have circular smooth muscle and we have longitudinal smooth muscle in other areas of the digestive tract, what we have in the stomach is the addition of another layer. And so we know that that's important, right? It wouldn't be there if it wasn't. So we add in another layer. We've got all these different fiber directions of the smooth muscle, and that's going to help to really contract the stomach to help churn food that enters the stomach into chyme, which is basically kind of like this sludgy um, food you know, it's kind of liquidy substance where we've taken this food and we've just basically pulverized it with the stomach. Okay, so here we have this um, in cross-section. This is what your stomach looks like um, situated in the body. This is coming down from the esophagus, traveling in, and here's our three layers of smooth muscle. So we've got a longitudinal layer, we've got a circular layer, and then we've got that extra third layer, that oblique layer um, of smooth muscle. So it helps us to really churn. Some interesting things too, we've got um, a, we call it a physiological sphincter at the entrance of the stomach. And so that's gonna be right about here and that's called the cardiac sphincter or gastroesophageal sphincter. And that controls um, movement from esophagus into the stomach um, and then also controls movement from the stomach back up into the esophagus. So if you, if you or anyone in your family has like reflux, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, that is a pretty common diagnosis for um, patients that you might see. What happens with that is um, contents of the stomach, which are highly acidic, basically reflux back up into the esophagus and can burn. Um, so you might hear patients talking about that. We also have um, the these folds inside the stomach and we call those rugae. And basically they're there to increase surface area uh, for absorption. And then at the very end of the stomach, we have another um, sphincter, and we call this the pyloric sphincter. And that basically controls emptying of the stomach. So it's going to control flow from stomach into small intestines. Okay, I did want to show you just a second. Um, I want to show you this video of um, this is what I'm going to turn off the music but this is showing you the peristaltic waves in the stomach and I always like this video I actually thought it was really interesting but you can see kind of this wave of smooth muscle contraction traveling down
And here's another wave coming through. <laughs> so, yep, but that's posted to Moodle. So there's your, um, there's your waves of contraction. There's your three layers of smooth muscle at work uh, traveling down. So peristaltic waves in the stomach. Okay, stomach is very acidic and it has a pH of around two, uh, which is super acidic. Um, and so what we see are a couple different things with cells in the stomach that play a role in this. So with a pH of two, we have an adaptation in the stomach that prevents our stomach from being burned up by its acidic contents. So we have um, epithelium that lines the interior of the stomach that has mucus cells and these guys are responsible for secreting this protective alkaline mucus that helps to decrease the acidity um, of the contents. We also have gland cells and so within the lining of the stomach if this is kind of the interior of the stomach we're gonna have these gastric glands that kind of um, are indented into the walls and they basically have cells that line these glands. And there's a couple different cells that we have here. So one of them are going, one type is parietal cells. And parietal cells are responsible for secreting hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor, which helps with absorption of substances from the digestive tract. Um, we also have chief cells that are gonna be present within these gland cells. And these are responsible for secreting pepsinogen which is the inactive form of pepsin and pepsin is used for protein digestion so that is a process that begins in the stomach. Um, chief cells also secrete lipases which are enzymes that are used for digestion of lipids. So pepsinogen is the inactive form and once it comes into contact with the hydrochloric acid it is then converted to the active form of pepsin. Um, the third type of cells that we have within the gastric glands are enteroendocrine cells. And these secrete another hormone called gastrin. And gastrin is important because it serves to stimulate the intestines um, during digestion and it also relaxes the ileocecal valve. And that's something that's going to come up in just a little bit. It's basically the valve that controls flow from the small intestines into the large intestines. So that's where gastrin comes in. So if you look, this is what we see here. This whole thing here is a gastric gland, this whole area. And you can see the different cells that we have contained within it. Here's our parietal cell. Here's our chief cell. So chief cells are going to release um, pepsinogen, um, parietal cells are going to release um, hydrochloric acid, and here's our um, inactive form of pepsinogen. Once it comes into contact with hydrochloric acid, it's converted to our active pepsin for protein digestion. And then here's our enteroendocrine cells as well. So all three of these cell types are going to be contained within um, the gastric glands within the wall of the stomach. Okay, so what types of digestive processes happen in the stomach? So this goes back to that list at the very beginning of um, all the different um, digestive processes that we see in the body. And I'm going to talk about each one of those processes as it relates to the organs that we come across. So we do have the process of pr propulsion in the stomach, you just saw that. You saw those waves of peristalsis um, with contraction of the smooth muscle. So propulsion happens. We do have mechanical breakdown. We have to. We've got three layers of smooth muscle in the stomach. And so they're there for a reason. They're going to help to churn that food and create chyme. We do have the, we have digestion that is starting to happen in the stomach. And this is mainly occurring through um, protein digestion um, because we have pepsin that's present in the stomach. So the main um, nutrient that's, a, that's digested in the stomach is going to be protein. And then we do have some absorption 
that happens in the stomach, it's actually not a lot. So absorption meaning we're pulling nutrients from the digestive tract back into our body and we're absorbing them into our bloodstream. So really the only two things that are absorbed in the stomach are alcohol and aspirin. Okay, so not really anything else, only alcohol and aspirin. Which kind of brings us to this. Um, I did want to include this because I, th I think that this is interesting. Um, these are kind of gastric bypass types of surgeries and you may run across these with your patients and I just think it's interesting to talk about so I was going to highlight a couple of these. This is, this is called a gastric bypass um, surgery and what happens with this is you basically are bypassing um, part of the small intestines and as we know not much food is absorbed in the stomach, right? food is mainly absorbed in the small intestines. And so what we're doing with this is we're having esophagus come down and it's basically routing, um, it's bypassing the stomach and connecting with the small intestines a little further down the route. So that food comes into less contact with the small intestines, so less food is absorbed. If the food's not being absorbed, where is it going? Well, it's basically just leaving your body, right? So you're going to have increased um, defecation of that food because your body doesn't have a chance to absorb it because it's not um, coming into contact with the small intestines. So that's one way for um, patients to um, lose weight if you have bariatric patients um, who are, you know, morbidly obese. This would be this would be a process that they could have done. Um, to help treat that. Uh, this is another one. This is much less invasive. This is called the lap band and you might run across people who've had this done but this is there's basically a um, band that they put around your stomach and this little end of it goes to the outside of your body and so you can actually change um, the tightness of this gastric band depending on you know your needs I guess. So um, this is an outpatient procedure. This is not, you know, they're not cutting anything or rerouting. You're basically just um, creating a smaller area. So now you've got this, you know, kind of small stomach area. It makes you feel full faster. Um, so you eat less. Um, this, I don't think, is going so well. I think a lot of patients who've had lap band procedures are showing some long-term complications, uh, which, is, which is not good for that. Um, this is another one. This is called a gastric sleeve. And so this is another type of surgery that can be done where they go in and they just make this kind of longitudinal cut of the stomach. So now food, as it's coming down your esophagus, it basically gets routed through this tiny, tiny little part of your stomach and then into the small intestines. Um, so you have less like stomach to access. Like none of this, this is now not used for food. So um, it's basically, you know, taking out um, about 60 to 80 percent of your stomach so that you've got a very small area here. You feel full faster, you eat less food. So um, yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. You'll, you know, you see patients who've had pro um, procedures like that done before. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about these accessory organs of um, digestion. So this is going to be liver and gallbladder and pancreas. And, and this is what we see here. Here's our liver. Um, here you can picture that from being in cadaver lab. Right underneath it, kind of tucked underneath, is our gallbladder. Um, and then here's pancreas um, here. So they're also going to play a role um, with digestion. So the liver, basically, if, if you cut the liver in cross-section and you look at it from the, um, if you look at the how the cells are arranged on the inside, they're basically like these hexagonal um, lobules of, of tissue. And they're going to contain hepatocytes. And those are liver cells. And so what we see is the way that these hexagons are arranged at each corner you're going to have a little branch of the hepatic artery. So there's our arterial blood supply. We're going to have a little branch of the hepatic portal vein. So there's our um, venous 
blood supply, and a bile duct. Okay, so what the liver is mainly doing for us digestive wise is it produces bile. So that's the liver's main function. And what does bile do for us? Well, bile is an alkaline solution. It's green in color, which is why, like if you remember when we were in Cadaver Lab and we saw the gallbladder and you could kind of see around it the, the coloration, um, it was slightly, or more than slightly, it was green. Um, that's the bile from the liver and then also from the gallbladder. So bile has a role in digesting fats. And so what it does is it emulsifies fat. So it takes fat droplets and it breaks them down into smaller um, pieces. Um, bile salts are made from cholesterol and our body does a great job of recycling them and reusing it. Bile also contains the pigment bilirubin, which is actually part of the heme group. If you remember hemoglobin, um, heme was the pigment that was associated with hemoglobin. So when red blood cells are broken down, because you know they have a lifespan of like you know 90 days or so, um, red blood cells are broken down into their component parts and recycled, that um, heme pigment um, basically contributes to bilirubin, uh, which gives bile its coloration as well. So here's our process of emulsification. So we have this large fat drop droplet, and when it comes into contact with bile, it's basically going to separate it out into these smaller fat droplets um, that help to increase surface area for um, enzymes to work. Okay, And here's our um, recycling of our bile salts. So basically, coming from our liver, here's our bile that's going to be secreted into the small intestines. It's basically going to do its work through the small intestines, and at the end of the small intestines, um, our bile salts are going to be reabsorbed um, at the distal part of the small intestines in the ileum. Those bile salts are reabsorbed into our capillaries and will travel back to the liver through the hepatic portal vein, and they are recycled and then used all over again. Okay, um, another organ that works closely with the liver is the gallbladder. And so this um, gallbladder, it's basically tucked right underneath the liver. So it's this little tiny um, organ and it's basically, you could think of it as like a muscular sac. So the liver makes the bile and it's continuously making bile, it makes it all the time. And what ends up happening is it's gonna secrete the bile through um, bile ducts and it basically travels through the common hepatic duct draining bile from the liver and um, travels into the gallbladder and is stored in the gallbladder. So the liver makes the bile and the gallbladder stores the bile. Okay, We also have the pancreas, which plays um, a role as an accessory organ of digestion as well. And the pancreas, basically, it lies horizontally. It's tucked right behind the stomach. And um, we know from endocrine system that the pancreas is both an endocrine and an exocrine gland. So as an endocrine gland, it's going to release the antagonistic hormones, insulin and glucagon. As an exocrine gland, it releases pancreatic juice. And that is really what it's called, pancreatic juice. So what is pancreatic juice? So pancreatic juice contains bicarb, which um, ends up creating an alkaline solution with a pH of about 8. So if you think about this, we've got um, coming from our stomach, basically very acidic um, pH of about 2, very acidic juices that are being dumped into the beginning of our small intestines. Well, pancreas is going to come now, like if this is our little pancreas here, it's going to release an alkaline solution of about 8 into the small intestines, and it's going to bring this 
um, these contents from the stomach that are coming that are highly acidic and it's going to bump their pH up so that it doesn't burn up our GI tract through the rest of the way. Um, pancreatic juice also is going to contain um, pancreatic enzymes. So we have lipases that are going to be um, responsible for breaking down fats. We have proteases that are responsible for breaking down proteins. We have amylase, which is going to be um, digestion of starch, and then nucleases, which um, break down nucleic acids into nucleotides. Okay, so how do we end up having the release of um, bile and pancreatic juice into the duodenum, which is the beginning of the small intestine? So if you look, we've got food that's going to travel down, it's going to come through the stomach, and it's going to now enter the small intestines. So what we end up having is um, this series of kind of canals that drain bile from the liver and bile that's being stored in the gallbladder, and it's going to empty it out into the duodenum. So basically what we have are going to be um, uh, bile ducts um, coming from the liver, and they're going to join to form a common hepatic duct here. Okay, Coming from the gallbladder, we're going to have a cystic duct that drains from the um, gallbladder. And ultimately, the cystic duct and the common um, hepatic duct are going to join to form the common bile duct. Okay, so this is going to be bringing bile, stored bile from the liver, I mean, sorry, stored bile from the gallbladder. Um, it's going to ultimately join with the pancreatic duct. Okay, we have a pancreatic duct that's coming from the pancreas that's going to be um, draining pancreatic juice. And they are basically both going to join together, this common bile duct and this pancreatic duct are going to join together at this little sphincter that's going to empty into the duodenum. And we call this the sphincter of Odi, and that's going to be this little sphincter here. Um, we also will see it called the hepatopancreatic sphincter, so you'll see it both ways. Um, but this is basically how bile and pancreatic juices are emptied into the duodenum um, of the small intestines. So how are they stimulated to be released? Well, like a lot of things in our body, um, it's stimulated by a hormone. And so the hormone in this case is um, CCK or cholecystokinin. And cholecystokinin is secreted by cells in the duodenum. So cells that are located in the beginning here of the duodenum, okay? And so what happens is when the stomach releases its chyme and it moves from the stomach into the beginning of the small intestines, it's going to contain um, proteins and fats within that chyme. And that's going to um, cause the cells in the duodenum to release cholecystokinin which does two things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to tell the gallbladder to contract. Because remember, the gallbladder is like this little muscular sac. And it's going to tell it to contract so that it can squeeze out its bile that it's been saving. And then it also is going to relax the sphincter of OD or the hepatopancreatic sphincter so that the bile can um, be expelled from the gallbladder and can travel down through the common bile duct and be excreted into the duodenum.